So I just joined the William & Mary community a couple months ago, and I have to admit I was pretty excited when I found out I'd be coming to work at William & Mary. You see, I'm a pretty big Thomas Jefferson fan, and to be able to work with the experience uh, where he grew up, in a sense, in the education, was a pretty unique opportunity. You know, my wife's from just up the road, uh, up in Charlottesville, and they still refer to Thomas Jefferson up there as Mr. Jefferson. But I have to say, I refer to him, and I like the way we prefer to him down here, Thomas Jefferson, class of 62. <laughs> For me, Thomas Jefferson is such a unique character because here at the college, he was exposed to a vast intellectual feast that would come to define his life. And one of the courses that he took was a class in geography. And I like to think of a young Thomas lying awake at night with his classmates, wondering what lay west of the Appalachian Mountains. Because the country at that time was young, vibrant, and growing, and much of it was un unexplored. At 40 years after his time at William & Mary, Thomas Jefferson had the chance to act on that curiosity. Writing to uh, Mr. Lewis and Mr. Clark, he authorized an expedition, and he wrote, now we begin to correctly delineate the great arteries of this great country. Those who come after us will fill up the canvas that we begin. And I think that is a beautiful phrase. Those who come after us will fill up the canvas that we begin. And Thomas Jefferson was not the only United States president that was exposed to mapping and cartography here at William & Mary. George Washington came here at the age of 17. Uh, we call him George Washington's Certificate of 49 because he got a certificate in survey methodology. This is not surveys of research, but surveys of how do you map lands and territories. And he said at that time, I am coming here because the want of maps of this country is a great disadvantage to me. He was able to turn this disadvantage to a great advantage in his life, both through his business and also when he was in the Ohio Valley in the French and the Indian Wars, doing the mapping work for the, for the military, which then served him to great advantage as he became commander of the Continental Army. The thing I find fascinating about Jefferson and Washington was they both were interested and passionate about creating and sharing information. At the team at A-Data where I work, we call that liberating the data. And so I'd like to start off our conversation with a question for you. In your lives, how do you interact with data? And how do you use this data to make your lives better and the lives of those you work with and the lives of the community in which you live? Because now we are not engaged in physically mapping territories. Uh, that's been done for the most part. But we are in an era where mountains and mountains of data are being created at every moment. And with these mountains of data, we need to liberate that information, to collect it, to analyze it, to share it, to manage it, and then act upon it. And right now at A-Data, we are currently working to map these pathways of information, not to create new maps or delineate boundaries of territories or new countries, but rather we are using this to push the frontiers of information forward in areas such as international development and foreign aid so we can use this to increase our impact in areas such as global health, climate change, food security, and support of democracy. In a sense, we are looking to use data to increase our impact because when we do this, we can increase the efficiency, the coordination, the targeting of some of the resources. Because at the end of the day, at Aid Data, we're looking to figure out how do we use this data for good and how do we save lives. And over the next several minutes, I'd like to share with you a couple of stories of how we work to do this at Aid Data. It's something that makes us get up in the morning and really strive to do what we think is a really great good in the world. And there's really no better place to begin than with a student-led project from the College of William & Mary back in 2010. For 2010, the World Bank came to us with a question. And the World Bank is one of the world's largest financial and development institutions. Over the past 60 years, they've given hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of aid. But they had a question, which they came to us, and they said, we've given all this money, but we cannot actually identify where this aid is going. It's a pretty big problem. And they weren't unique in this. United States Agency for International Development, uh, other donors from around the world ha have a similar problem, have a similar challenge. But fortunately at this time, uh, the Aid Data Partnership, which is, consists of the College of William & Mary, uh, Brigham Young University, and also Development Gateway, which is an innovation tech firm in DC, we were working on a georeferencing, the latitude and longitude coordinates of some of these projects. And the World Bank saw the value in the work that our students and faculty and staff were doing, but they said, this is going to take way too much money and too much time. Some estimates had hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of several years. But we said, no, we don't buy that. Give us a chance. And we convinced a group at the World Bank called the Open Data Evangelist to give us a shot. So that summer, in summer 2010, 
a group of students sat in a conference room on a very ambitious project, trying to identify these coordinates of the World Bank's activities, and they achieved quite a remarkable result. Over that summer, they coded 2,500 projects in 30,000 locations and 144 countries, the entire World Bank active portfolio. And it's important to know that these students didn't create this information. This was not out of thin air, but this was information located in hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands, of pages of project documents. In a sense, the effort to liberate this information, to democratize the data, and achieve something that was interesting because even someone who had worked on a certain desk at the World Bank over a certain country for several years now had this information in a different way, in a way that was very liberating to them. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. Uh, this is a map of Kenya. And you can see in the top right corner the high percentage of population in poverty. You'll notice also that there are not a lot of projects in that coordinate. If you go down to the southwest coordinate, you'll see a lot of World Bank projects and lower incidence of poverty. And this map caused a great deal of introspection and discussion in the World Bank. Are we giving the resources to the right areas? Are the right people receiving it? Who else is working in these areas? And I think this is an interesting question. Uh, because it shows the power of data presented in a different way, managed a different way, to start, help us start asking the right questions. And when the World Bank president at the time, Robert Zellick, saw this, he immediately grasped its significance. He used this map to really leapfrog and launch the World Bank into this open data, open data world. And uh, two years later, uh, this geocoding methodology, started by the students, was adopted by, uh, as a global and international standard a really remarkable work. And of course, at A-Data, we were happy with this. This is a great story, but, but we were not content with this at, at all. And some of you may have already seen the problem with this. Because in, in the development community, oftentimes, we face duplication of efforts. Uh, activities are not coordinated. You'll have an example where a veterinarian clinic is put on one side of the road. Another donor comes and put a veterinary clinic right on the other side of the road in the same village, effectively eliminating the need for the ability for this business to grow. And we see this repeated time and time again. And what we have with the World Bank map that we just showed was the activities of the World Bank one donor. But if I'm going to donate resources in a resource scarce environment, I want to know who else is in this area. I want to know if someone else is working the same project. I want to know if someone's working the same area. And so in summer of 2011, we teamed up with the University of Texas at Austin and the Ministry of Finance in Malawi to answer a single question, really. Was it possible to coordinate and geocoded the entire universe of aid projects in one country. And to make a long story short, it, it's possible. And here's a map of all the activities and donors in the country of Malawi. And what this starts to do, as Jefferson might say, is now we're beginning to delineate the great arteries of development. Here we're starting to see who is working where, when, and how. And let me go a little deeper to show you how this may play out for someone. If, if I'm a desk officer, I have to give funds, how this is helpful. And I'm going to show you one map that does not use subnational data, just uses countrywide data. And this is looking at vulnerability of climate change. If you look at this map, you can see that Malawi has some vulnerability of climate change. This could be useful if I was comparing Malawi vis-a-vis -vis another country. But if I'm going to invest resources in there, my question is, what district do I put this in? What village do I work with? Who else is working there? Is anyone else doing the same thing I am? If they are, can I do a different activity? So if you use subnational data, with the geocoded locations, now we are getting someplace. Now we are starting to see how we better use these funds to deliver impact and delivering impact to save lives. It's little wonder that the Ministry of Finance, Ken Lepenga said, being able to see in a map all the donor funded activities has transformed the way we think about development. And let me just give you one last example before I talk about why I think uh, we've been able to have such an impact through the activities of the College of William & Mary. And this is something for the future. This map behind me is an example of using crowdsourced technology through a mobile platform to get impact from people on the ground about aid. You see, one of the problems we have in development is there's large amounts of money at some times, but they're being funded by donors or by the host country, the line ministries. They're not being sourced with the input from people on the ground in the communities. They call this a broken feedback loop. We're pushing down, we're not getting the impact back up. And so what we decided to do with UNICEF in Uganda was to do a pilot test. Using the geocoded information as our informational infrastructure, we then asked people in the community to give us back input on how well these projects were located. 
or sorry, how, how far they were doing to do good in their communities. And by using the geocode locations, we could match the specific response using the SMS technology with the precise project on the ground. And we think this has extraordinary potential as we go forward to close and mend the broken feedback loop so that we can get better feedback and deliver better results for people. Now, the question may be, why has Willem & Mary, as a partner in A-Data, been able to drive this research and innovation to achieve some of these transform transformational effects? I think the question really has to do is not why are we located in Paris or Brussels or London, these traditional heavyweights in the developing world, or even Silicon Valley, but it has to do with the, the resource that Willem & Mary has. And this resource is uh, the intellectually curious, passion and driving, I never take no for an answer, undergrad. It's the greatest resource this campus has, and time and time again, it has pushed a data to, take, to go to the next level. And I want to share an example of this, how this played out. Um, back in 2010, Austin Strange, class of 2012, was walking across the sunken garden, and he ran into Professor Michael Tierney, class of 20, uh, 1987. Uh, and in this conversation, Austin said, Professor, I have an idea, and because I'd like to know, how do we better understand what donors are doing in different countries who don't publish your work. This is Venezuela, is your Iran's, your China's uh, of the world. And he said, Professor, I think I know an answer. These, these countries come in and they want to advertise their work. They want to get credit for it. By using a media-based methodology, I think we can collect this information. What do you think? And Professor Tierney said, Austin, this sounds like a great idea. I have no idea if it will work. But go out and build your team, and let's see what happens. And in the course of the last two years, Austin Strange and his A-Data research team has created a transparent methodology to track Chinese development flows to Africa. It is now the world's largest publicly available database. They've undercovered 3,000 projects, tracking over 130 billion in financing that we didn't know existed before. It's really a remarkable event. And the demand for this research has been extraordinary. We've received requesting for briefings from the Defense Department, the Intelligence Community, Congress, and the State Department. We're going public with this site in the end of April with the Center for Global Development. And next week, four of our students from William & Mary were asked by the Clinton Global Initiative to come out and brief them at their annual conference. And the thing about Austin Strange's story is that it's actually not that unique to A-Data. It actually has some of its roots in our founding story. Back in 2001, uh, Brad Parks, class of 20, 2003, was teaching English in an Ecuador village at the edge of the Amazon rainforest. And at the village, uh, the villagers, to, to provide for their livelihoods, uh, received aid to help them invest in agricultural products. Um, and do so, they cut, they cut down large swaths of the forest. And one day, a torrential rainstorm swept through the area, and there was no longer the force of the roots to absorb the water. Um, the resulting landslides swept through the village, uh, moving and pushing houses into the river and killing some of Brad's students. When he came back to William & Mary, he was determined to, to make an impact, so he wanted to study for his undergraduate thesis, the impact of environmental aid. But he found that when he went to do the research, the data were locked away, uh, they were not accessible, or they're not sufficiently detailed. So Brad went out with his faculty advisors, including Professor Tierney, right down the street to Dog Street Pub. And as they talked about this, they launched an audacious plan to create the world's largest, most public, transparent, and detailed database of how do we track and analyze development flows. In a sense, to kick down the walls of the fortress of data that were being housed, to unleash it, to liberate it, to put it in the hands of people throughout the world so that we could better assess the impact of aid and to make that impact. They applied for a National Science Foundation grant. That grant catalyzed, in turn, funding from other partners, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the World Bank, and brought on board other partners and founders. And all along during this process, it was being powered by the undergrads at the William & Mary. The undergrads went to the foreign capitals to get the data. They created the database to manage the data. They analyzed the data. They performed research and published and peer-reviewed uh, papers with their faculty advisors. And since that time, a data has grown to 40 professional staff, a faculty network of 100 uh, faculty advisors from 50 universities here in the developing world, Right now, right now on staff, we have over 100 research assistants and interns. And we have an active relationship and work in 15 developing countries. And along the way, 
We have now created the world's largest, most transparent, and public database. We now track five trillion in aid. And we think we can do even more. When Jefferson uh, put that mapping expedition in place, he gave it $2,500 for their effort. And last fall, the United States government has once again decided to make an investment in mapping expedition, but this time for the developing world. The United States Agency for International Development invited Elena Stern, along with others of the ADA team and staff, to Washington, D.C. to sign a $25 million cooperative agreement over the next five years. It's the largest single grant award in the history of the College of William and Mary. This will dramatically increase our ability to increase our reach, our impact. We'll be able to work with universities, civil society organizations. We'll be able to close that broken feedback loop. And the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said, a data will help USAID advance its use of data and analytics to improve decision making. We hope that's true. We believe that's true. And we get up every morning determined to make sure that's true. And I think that if Jefferson and Washington knew about a data, they would have been excited, but they would not have been surprised. And they would not have been surprised because the environment that held true in their day holds true in our day. That if there is a question that does not have an answer, faculty, students, staff at William Mary are really not content to let that answer lie. They'll hunt for it, they'll chase it, they'll pursue it, they'll build upon it. And when they have that answer in their hand, then they'll use that answer to make a difference. And so just to return to the, to the question we started off, the data in your lives, how do you use it? And do you use it to engage with people in your community to do better? The people you work with and in your own lives. We data data, we don't always do it well, but that is our drive, that is our mission, to use this data to do good. And that's why I like to think, although I don't know, that if a young Thomas Jefferson were to appear at the College of William Mary in the fall of 2013, we may very well find him in the newest cohort of a data as a research assistant, determined to liberate the data and to do good in the world. Thank you.